Okay, so we're going to talk about a feature that's in Java 9 called compact strings, which you may or may not have heard of. Anybody here on Java 9 or Java 10? Okay, so for you guys that are not on Java 9 or 10, part of my objective tonight is to convince you by showing you what compact strings are, why this feature alone is enough for you to be able to go back to your people and say, hey, just because of this one feature in JDK9, we can probably get this return on our investment in time and what we're going to save in memory. So that's part of what I'm going to try to accomplish tonight. The other thing that I think you'll gain out of this is, this is part of the reason I decided to do this presentation. Compact strings is essentially, if you remember in the Java standard characters, take up two bytes. So when you create a string, for each character, we're using two bytes. If you think about ASCII characters, they're seven bits. So oftentimes, we're not using one of those two bytes in that string. So what we're doing with this feature is we're taking and changing the way that we're internally representing a string to use one byte instead of two bytes. And we're doing it transparently to you or somebody who is running a Java program. Even somebody who's writing a Java program doesn't even need to worry about this. So you think about how pervasively used a string class is. Part of what I want you to gain out of this presentation is what's the methodology behind what we did to ensure that we didn't ruin somebody's application in terms of its performance. So this might be something that you can take back and utilize as the methodology that we use because you probably have some application that maybe you're thinking about making some rather pervasive change in it, but you have some reluctance around it because it may impact a lot of people. So how do you mitigate that sort of risk around? How can we go about developing this and ensure that we're not going to impact a lot of people? Okay. Standard Oracle disclaimer here. Basically it says, don't believe a word I say. Uh, but all in seriousness, it's just one of these things legal always has this ad. Um, there's nothing in here that talks about forward leading sort of statements, so uh, I don't think there's anything in here that really applies to that disclosure. Okay, a little bit about myself. You heard a little bit uh, already. Um, I lead a lot of different, uh, various different projects. That that it tend to be focused on the hotspot JVM. So external to Oracle, most people think of Java uh, kind of as a whole black box. Internally inside of development, we're structured in a way where there's the Java virtual machine itself, and then there's, there's this set of class libraries, in other words, Java SE, that runs on top of it. So there's kind of this clear sort of separation between the hotspot Java virtual machine and that set of class libraries or Java SE that runs on top of it. So I work in this part that's part of the hotspot JVM. My expertise, as you can tell here, is, is in the performance area. About, I guess it's been almost seven years ago already, this book here called Java Performance was published. Um, it's starting to get a little bit dated in some of the content, but I think a lot of what's in there is still very applicable today. If you like to read alternative languages, there's actually a Chinese version of this. It's rather interesting, the thickness of this book. I forgot to bring that with me. It's almost twice as thick as the English version. And that's kind of a funny story. One of my older brothers is a truck driver. And when I published this book, it was, this was prior to the Chinese version coming out. He says, can I, can I get a copy? So I gave it to him. A week later, he calls me back and he says, can you give me one that's written in English? <laughs> <laughs> so a couple of years ago, uh, myself and a couple of other engineers, um, you may have heard of Monica Beckwith. Monica and I worked together on the performance team for a long time. Uh, Monica's off doing independent work now. When we first started working on the G1 garbage collector, I started the initial performance work on that. 
and then I turned that over to, to Monica probably about a year and a half, two years into the development of G1. So, Vent Rudison was a, an engineer who worked on the development of G1, and Poonam is somebody that works in our serviceability area, uh, kind of a troubleshooting uh, serviceability type of engineer. So the four of us collaborated together to write this Java Performance Companion. Its intention was to be complementary material to what was in the initial Java Performance Book. If you're looking at or you're using G1GC, this is probably one of the references that you're going to kind of want to have around. So enough about me. Um, I talked a little bit about what to expect in this presentation. Um, so I'll skip this. So, so the agenda we've got here is, I'll do a little introduction here, which uh, I've covered a little bit of that already. We'll talk a little bit about the motivation for the feature, some pre-analysis work that we did, the design and implementation that we did for the spring class, and then how we validated in our testing approach. So, Compact Strings was JEP 254. Anybody in here heard of that terminology or the acronym JEP? Okay, so let me explain what a JEP is for those that haven't heard that term. So, JEP stands for a Java Enhancement Proposal. And if I jump ahead one slide here, you can see it there that that's the acronym name. Anybody can write A Java enhancement proposal. There's a structure that it has. So in essence, anybody here can make a proposal to make an enhancement to Java the language or the Java virtual machine. And you can see some of the artifacts that are associated with it, such as an author, an owner, who it's reviewed by, who it's endorsed by, what release it's targeted for. And then there's a, a bug or an issue that's filed related to it. This seven got truncated off over here, so you can see the issue number here got filed in here. So if you wanted to look up a little more information on these and wanted to see the detail of what one of the structure one of these looks like, you could do that. So the feature name was called Compact Strings. Internally, we referred to the project as string density. Density meaning that we're trying to reduce our memory footprint. So there's a rather large people, number of people that work on this. Uh, quite a few people from Oracle, a couple of people from Intel who contributed to this also. To give you an idea of how much was involved with this, so if you think about this and say, geez, all you're doing is you're making a change to the string class and you're going to represent something as a single byte, a character as a single byte rather than two bytes, gosh, that doesn't sound like a lot of work. But there is an enormous amount of work that goes into this, and, I, and I'll talk a little bit about what all was involved with this here in a few slides. But to give you an idea of the amount of effort that went into this, so we had 10 different engineers that were contributing to this, eight of them from Oracle, two of them from Intel. Each one of us spent about a year and about half of our time working on this project. So approximately about a five-man year effort went into this. So it was a lot of work. So for project goals, our requirements were to improve the space efficiency of string and the related classes. So some of those related classes would be string builder or string buffer. Preserve throughput and latency. This is kind of a hard one when you think about, okay, how can I maintain or not have a regression related to throughput? That's kind of a hard one in thinking about, okay, I need to be able to deal with multi-byte characters and also transparently deal with, with single-byte characters. Preserve compatibility. Java supports UTF-16, but we also know that many apps only use one byte out of those two, or two bytes representing a character. Also, to not introduce any new Java SE APIs, because in doing that, that involves the whole JSR and the JCP type of process. So that's a very long, slow turnaround time. So we wanted to avoid introducing any new Java SE APIs. 
So in JDK 6, there was a feature called compressed strings. I don't know how widely it was used. It was largely implemented to improve uh, the performance of several different benchmarks. And it was an all or nothing sort of, of capability. It basically, when you said you used this capability, or basically when you used this capability, you were saying, I know that my Java application only ever uses single byte characters. If you had something that out tried to allocate a multi-byte character, your application was probably going to break and may actually even crash. So it really was not really, in my opinion, it really wasn't a good sort of alternative. So that was part of the motivation here was to have an implementation that could replace compressed strings. And then these are the platforms and the operating systems that this feature is supported on. So on to motivation and some preliminary analysis. So at Oracle, we have over 950 heap dumps from, that they're in a repository that come from a variety of different areas. Most of them come from Oracle Fusion middleware, uh, from Fusion applications, or other Oracle Java applications. We have this huge repository of heap dumps. One of the tools that we use in doing our, our data collection for measuring the memory footprint, we use this thing called the Java Object Layout Tools. And if you're not familiar with this, you can do a search on it. Basically what it does is, it's a program, you feed it a Java class, and it'll tell you what its memory footprint is. It'll tell you how, much, how many bytes does that class take up. And we did this analysis on a 32-bit JVM, a 64-bit JVM, uh, so this would be a pure 64-bit JVM, in other words, with compressed references disabled. And then a 64-bit JVM with uh, compressed references with an, the default of an 8-byte alignment. So when you allocate objects into the Java heap, they are aligned on 8-byte boundaries by default. That actually feeds into the compressed references and how that sort of magic works. Um, if you're bored someday, I can sit down and explain to you how that works um, if you're not familiar with how compressed references work. But it's based on this knowledge that Java objects are on 8-byte alignments. There's another variation of this where you can increase the alignment to 16 bytes and you can have a larger Java heap. So those were the four different configurations of the JVM that we included in our data collection. This is a rather busy slide, and I'll walk you through this. So we took this 950-some-odd heap down set. We started looking at this with the Java Object Layout tool, and we wanted to get an idea of what's the distribution. In other words, what are what is the amount of space that the strings in the Java heap are taking up? We wanted to get an idea of what that looked like. So, this top graph here is looking at our heap dumps that came from 32-bit JVMs. And this left side here is the number of heap dumps where uh, the, and the x-axis here is the live data size. So this gives us an idea of, of our live data in the Java heap. Here's the number of heap dumps that are, so you can see there's a large number of heap dumps in this area, you know, of having a, oh, let's see, maybe between a two and a 500 megabyte sort of live data size. But you can see this as you start to look at a 64-bit JVM, this sort of curve that you see here kind of gets stretched out and expanded. Part of that's because we're now on 16-byte alignments rather than um, eight byte alignment. The other part of it too is, um, okay, that's a press two plug. So if we look down here at the bottom one here, this is the pure 64 bit JVM. You can see how these guys are kind of a stressed version of the other two. Okay, so this is another rather busy slide, but what we're trying to figure out here is. 
what is the character arrays consumption in the Java heap? In other words, how much of that Java heap is contributed to character arrays or strings? So the key down here at the bottom, which you can't see, which is unfortunate, um, the green bars here are the total care arrays. I'm sorry. The green bar here is the one byte care arrays. In other words, they are ones that have single bytes. They could be representative of a single byte care array. This blue one here is the number of, or the percentage of live data that has um, two byte characters. So basically what this is telling us is that in these 950 some odd heap dumps, the care arrays are consuming somewhere between 10% and 45% of the live data. Uh, let's see. And the other thing that we realized from this is that most of these care arrays are single byte characters. The other one here is about that 64-bit JVM. Uh, it has a little bit larger object header size. If you're not familiar with this term of an object header, when you allocate an object into the Java heap internally, at the head of that Java object is this object header. So it has some metadata about the object that you just allocated. So another busy slide here, <coughs> probably making you dizzy at this point. We're trying to get an idea of what is the typical size or what are the size of these strings look like? What's that sort of distribution look like? So I'm actually going to start with this one over here. So our x-axis here is the character count, in other words, that length of that string. And then this one is the, uh, the number of times that we see that particular size of a string. So you can see here up to 10,000 in length, there's a really sharp bend here. So these next two charts, as we're starting to zoom in on this a little bit, and you can see here, we're really starting to see a large number of strings here showing up at less than 50 characters. And in fact, 75% of the strings are all smaller than 35 characters. So that's a really useful piece of information. It gives us an idea of how much memory we can save per string. So what that amounts to is we can get about a 35 to a 40% reduction per string. Keep in mind that that's less than the 50% in the ideal world because instead of using two bytes per character, we're going to be using one, which would be 50% of that we're really only going to realize about 35 to 40%. And the reason for that is, is this object header. So this object header is going to consume a little bit of space in the Java heap, which gets us down to that 35 to 40%. What this means in terms of live data in an application, we estimate it's somewhere between 5 and 15% on most Java applications. So based on this 950 some odd heap dumps, they would save between 5 and 15% of live data size. So in other words, you could run that same Java app with 5 to 15% smaller Java <coughs> and realize probably the same performance, maybe even better. So I think a good question that you could ask yourself in terms of your applications, if you could save 5 to 15% of Java Heap on every one of your Java apps, what does that translate to in savings for your company? That's an argument or a piece of data that you can go back and say, hey, this is enough reason for us to think about moving to Java 9. That'll probably more than cover your cost in the effort to move to Java 9. Okay, so I'll shift to talking about the design and implementation of the string class. So our requirements for this new string class were to preserve full compatibility for all related Java apps and native interfaces. So no change is required for you to do any of your applications, no recompilation, you don't have to do any of that. That it just takes an existing app and it can run it. We're only going to change the internal representation of the string class and make a bunch of changes inside of the JVM. We're going to avoid adding any public APIs, which we were able to do. 
And as I mentioned earlier, if you're going to add a Java API, it requires a JSR and you're subject to this JCP process, which is a, you tends to be a much longer, slower turnaround. So the design here. So string characters are encoded either as UTF-16 or ISO 8859-1 or otherwise known as Latin 1. So this Latin 1 encoding turns out to be the same encoding of a UTF-16 but taking the leading byte of it off. So that becomes pretty simple for us to represent. Then we'll use a byte array instead of a char array to store the characters in the string. So if you look at JDK8 and you look at string.java, you'll see that there's a char array in that class. We change that to be byte array. And when you allocate a string, if we identify that that string that you're trying to allocate has one character, or can be represented as one byte per character, we will store it in a Latin one encoding. If we find that there's at least one character in there that occupies more than one byte, we will store it in UTF-16. So what we did here is we added a private byte field to string, to string.java, to represent which encoding that we're using. This also gave us the ability to extend it to support different types of character encodings if one wanted to. So say you wanted to take the JVM and you had some other character encoding that you wanted to use, it'd be pretty easy to do. So we'll come back to this design decision here in just a couple of slides. So I talked about this, so if strings with the leading byte and all of those incoming characters when you're constructing a string are zero, in other words, they're single byte characters, then they're a candidate to be compressed. And as I mentioned, these are the Latin one encoding. And if any of these strings is non-zero, in other words, that leading byte is non-zero, we're going to store it as two bytes using UTF-16. Okay. A lot of people have asked us at that time, why aren't you using UTF-8? UTF-8 is used everywhere. That's a reasonable question. Well, the reason we didn't use UTF-8 is we're stupid. I'm just joking, of course. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so UTF-8, here, here's the reason why we didn't use UTF-8. UTF-8 supports variable width characters. This is what the encoding supports. If you think about the operations on the string class, think about, uh, you know, care add or you're doing like a, a substring. A lot of these operations require a random access where you're trying to use an index into some element of the underlying array. Okay, if you've got variable with characters, how do you figure that out? You're gonna have to walk down that character array to get to each element. So if we used UTF-8, our throughput performance would really suffer because we can't make this assumption that every character is a certain size or a certain number of elements can get us to an offset into that character or that byte array. So there's a lot of these string APIs that rely on that rapid random access. So at the end of the day, what this really means is this UTF-8 encoding is great for character transmission. It's really not a good choice performance-wise for Java string operations. Okay, so here is the JDK8, the key pieces of the string class. Here's what this new implementation looks like. So if you look in JDK9 or 10, you'll see that this is what the string class now looks like. So here is that field that identifies which encoding we're using. So this is some output from that Java uh, memory layout tools. And what this is identifying for us is, because we're adding this field, what impact is that having on the size of the string class and how much space it takes up in the Java? Game? So <clears throat> you remember I said that Java objects are eight byte line. So if we're adding a field, 
are we tripping over an eight byte boundary that now we've got to add another eight bytes per string object? So if we're going to do that, we have to understand what the impact of that's going to be. So we're trying to get an idea from a memory footprint standpoint, what's going to happen here? So in the 32-bit JVM, the JDK8 string object is actually perfectly aligned at 16 bytes. This was before we added the byte field. So here, because we're going to add a byte field, we're now going to increase the size of the string class. So it's going to use eight more bytes. OK. What happens in the 64-bit JVM? So in the 64-bit JVM, uh, let's see. We have an extra four bytes to work with here. So this piece down here, these trailing four bytes that are in here, because we're eight byte aligned, this is what we call padding. So it's padding at the end of an object until we, so we can get to that next eight byte boundary. So here, this additional byte field can fit here without any problem. It's not going to change the internal representation for, for the string object. The same turns out to be true here for the compressed references JVMs, whether we're 8-byte aligned compressed references or 16-byte. So we have padding that's available to us. The sizes of those are not going to increase any. So that's good news. So OK, what do we do about the 32-bit JVM? Well, if we sit down and we think about this a little bit, We can gain this eight bytes back that we're growing the string object as soon as you have a string that's at least 16 characters in length. Because remember, if you've got single byte care representation, you have 16 characters, I'm not going to use eight byte or eight fewer or half as, half as many uh, elements and use half as many bytes. I'll gain that eight bytes back. And if you sh there should be a net gain here. If you look back at that chart that I had that showed what the string sizes were, what that distribution looked like, this is probably going to be a net gain overall for the 32-bit JVM. And as I mentioned, there's no increase here for the 64-bit JVMs. OK. This final, or this private byte coder field, OK. You'd look at that and say, geez, when I looked at your string class and you added this byte field here, why didn't you virtualize the coders via an interface or an abstract class? So why didn't you have a string class, something that's for, for UTF-16 and another one for Latin 1? And that could have prevented you from introducing this field. OK. So the reason that we didn't do this is we needed to preserve throughput. The cost of making a virtual call is non-trivial. And, and in fact, virtualization probably inhibits one of the most profound optimizations that a JVM's JIP compiler can do called inlining. So virtualization is something that can prevent inlining, which turns around and, and then helps you with performance. So, for non-trivial non JIT compilers, in other words, ones that are very smart, like the Dash Client JIT compiler and Hotspot, this cost of making the virtualized call really shows up here. Dash Server, which you're accustomed to using probably, most of you probably use this Dash Server JIT compiler. Most of the time, it can successfully de-virtualize those which means that it can turn around and inline and then you can not experience the performance penalty. So we did some detailed performance analysis here and what it showed was a branch condition on this coder field and then a call to a static method, which this is also known as a static dispatch, offered better throughput performance on these non-optimizing JIT compilers. And if you want to see the analysis of how we did this, you can take a look at this URL.
So some other things here related to the string class. So there is a very, very large number of string optimizations in the hotspot JVM. Because string is so pervasive, to gain a lot of performance, we have made a lot of optimizations. So what I mean by that is the JIT compiler has, we call them intrinsics, which are essentially, they're assembly instructions that we will stub in for a particular construct of, you know, for a Java method, for instance. So it's highly optimized. And because string class is so heavily used, many of its APIs have highly optimized code, in other words, intrinsics for them. And many of these use SIMD instructions. So single instruction, multiple dispatch instructions. So we re-implemented many of these optimizations and we also introduced some new ones. There's about 55 specific JIT compiler optimizations just for the string class alone. And it's, it's a non-trivial amount of work. And these are non-portable across hardware platforms. You have, if you implement an intrinsic on one hardware platform, you implement that on any other platform that you support. So it's a lot of work. The question to ask yourself down here is, if you went off and implemented your own string class and said, hey, I want to have single byte pairs. I know my application only ever uses single byte pairs. I'm going to write my own string class and we'll use that. Why is that not a good idea? The answer is up here. Right there. String class is very highly optimized. It's not going to identify your string class because this is Java line string. Yours is going to be something else. It's going to be some package name dot string. So you're not going to realize the performance that you would realize using Java line string. Okay, so what did we do in terms of validating our implementation and our testing approach? So this section here, I hope that there's some pieces out of here that you can utilize that if you're going to touch something in one of your applications that's rather pervasively used and you have some concerns about what the impact is going to be. So that's what I'm hoping you can kind of take out of this section. So in the terms of memory footprint, um, in the 32-bit JVM, we know that we're going to gain back uh, a win as soon as we have strengths that are greater than or equal to 16 in length. Um, we also know that compressible strings dominate the string population. On the 64-bit JVMs, we know that we're not going to see an increase in the footprint. So we kind of broke this out into the three major pieces of performance. What's the memory footprint going to be, impact going to be, what's the latency, and what's the throughput impact going to be. So here's where you can find this Java object layout tool. So as I mentioned, string is very pervasively used. How did we go about validating that there are no regressions in Java apps that use string? Well, we probably can, regardless of the method or the approach. Is it reasonable to try to test as many applications or workloads as possible? You know, how would we categorize a general type of application or give an app or a workload that it represents? How do we convince ourselves of the number of different families that we would have to test? So if you're looking at this kind of from the top down, okay, how would I go about doing this? Well, what we looked at doing instead was we looked at it from the bottom up, if you will, and said, let's develop a micro benchmark for every public string API and any of the impacted string builder and string buffer APIs that are impacted by this change that we're making. We developed over 400 micro benchmarks to do this testing. So this, you may have heard of JMH, this Java micro benchmark harness. Here's the URL for it. For each public API on string and related string builder and string buffer classes, we test with all compressible characters, a compressible character at the beginning of the string, and a compressible character at the end. So one of the intrinsics that we implemented for this is we're scanning that string when you go to construct it to see if those are all single byte pairs. So we're trying to do this as quickly as we can. 
So if you think about this, this compressible character at the end of the string, okay, if you're going down through this sequence of characters, and the very last one is, oh, it's a multibyte. Now I've got to represent it. Okay. That's one of the reasons we put this at the end. So in other words, if we find it right away, what's the, what's the impact there on the API? Or if we find it at the end, what's the impact? And if there's all compressible, what's the best case scenario? Okay, so we took, in essence, the baseline JDK 9, which was the initial, the old JDK 8 implementation. We tested that against our new string class. If you want to take a look at all of these different benchmarks that we implemented, you can look at them here, and if you wanted to run them, you could. And if you wanted to look at the results, and if you wanted to see some of the other artifacts that we have from this testing. So these micro benchmarks drove us to what were those JIT compiler optimizations, in other words, those intrinsics we needed to implement where we introduced a regression. So we used the ability to implement an intrinsic to overcome the performance regression. Or we modified existing intrinsics so that they could overcome any sort of regression. So our approach was we couldn't test every application that used Java Lang strength. Did you want to, you want to take a break? Yeah. Uh, okay. We want to take like a 10 minute break, grab some food, and then come back. Okay. We probably have got about another five or six slides here, is about all. Okay. Well, I'll get this finished up here while you're eating. Um, so, back to this approach and this strategy, if I was to summarize it. The approach that we used here is, we tested the throughput of each one of these APIs that were affected by the change that we made in the string, string builder, and string buffer class. The challenge for at doing this was, this requires a special job of performance expertise to avoid those common sort of Java micro benchmarking sort of issues that can come up. Um, the good news is, we have those skills to be able to do that. This would be something that would, so if you took on this sort of task for yourself, it would be a little bit harder to do with writing these micro benchmarks. The good news is with the Java micro benchmarking harness, JMH, it alleviates a lot of those pitfalls that you fall into. So if you use JMH and you're wanting to write some micro benchmarks, you'll avoid a lot of those sort of micro benchmarking pitfalls. Um, the other place that it takes a little bit of some expertise is you have to do some reasoning about if I see something like maybe a five or ten nanosecond regression in an API performance, what is the real impact of that? Things that factor into that, okay, do I have some information or some data that says how frequently is this API called? How often is it called in a given application? That gives you a sense of, okay, if this is a dominating API and I have a 10 or a 50, 50 nanosecond regression, that might be something I'm interested in looking at that API I know is being used a lot. If I have information that tells me. If it's something that's not being used very much at all, maybe 10 to 50 milliseconds doesn't really matter. So you have to do a little bit of reasoning about if you see a regression, how much of that regression really shows up if you're talking about nanoseconds, even hundreds of nanoseconds, performance and latency at a macro level, at an app level, how many people are going to be able to detect that? Not very many. Maybe there's some people that are working on trading systems that detect at the hundreds of nanoseconds level. But I would bet at the enterprise level, enterprise apps, no, they're not going to do that. But if you're talking about 10 nanoseconds and an API to call very, very infrequently, probably not even the training systems, they're going to have a hard time identifying that. So there's a little bit of expertise and a little bit of an art here that you go through with this reasoning. 
So what did we do in terms of validating throughput? So what did we do to convince ourselves that our approach here is working? So we focus primarily on two benchmarks. One of them is called SEC JDD 2005, the other one 2015. And although the names of these being SPEC JVB are the same, these two benchmarks could not be more different from each other than what these names are. They are two totally different implementations. You know, they don't even implement the same workload. I mean, they are just two totally different workloads. On SPEC JVB, the live data size reduction, in other words, the amount of live data in the Java heap, was about 7%. So there's two metrics that are reported by this benchmark. One of them is called critical JOPS, which is a latency metric. So what it does is it takes application response times and takes a geometric mean of application response times that are within a certain uh, number of milliseconds. And then that's computed into this critical JOPS. We actually realized about an 11% reduction and latency. So here we've got a memory foot re reduction. We've also improved our latency. So our requirement was to maintain our latency or improve it. This max JOPS number is something, how many operations can you, can you do when your system is saturated? So in other words, it's a throughput number. We increased this throughput number by about 3%. So here we got a, a footprint reduction, we reduced latency, and we actually improved throughput. This is really uncommon. It's very uncommon that you can realize improvements in every one of these areas, whether usually you have a trade-off between if you improve, say you improve throughput, usually you're sacrificing something in one of those other areas. Rarely do you ever improve in all three of those. And if you improve in all three of those, it takes a lot of work. Remember, there's five million years worth of effort here. It took a lot of work. Spec JVB. So Spec JVB only produces a throughput number. Its live data size reduced by 21%. The reason for that is, I know this benchmark intimately because I did an enormous amount of work with it. Actually, both of these I did a lot of work with. Um, did a lot of performance analysis on this guy. It does an enormous amount of spring allocations. In terms of allocations of objects, somewhere around 60%, 55 to 60% of the objects that are allocated by this benchmark are string objects. Hence, this number here. So this is pretty high relative to here. The throughput increase was about 5%. There was a 23% reduction in how frequent GCs were occurring. So we used the same size Java heap. GC was occurring 23% less frequently. That also helped translate to this increase in throughput. So again, we got improvements in footprint, latency, and also throughput. So hopefully this has piqued your interest a little bit or you have some intrigue with it. Go take JDK9 and take it out for a spin, or take JDK10, take it out for a spin. Give it, give it a shot. The feature is enabled by compact strings. This is automatically on, so you don't have to use this command line switch. It's automatically enabled. For, for some reason, you want to disable it, you can. So make some acknowledgments here. Um, the team that worked on this, uh, terrific team. This is probably one of the features that I enjoyed working on the most. Um, I had a lot of fun working on this. It was, there was a lot of challenges with it. Um, I think we did a very nice job with it. Some additional artifacts, um, if you wanted to take a look at it. Myself and Sandia from Intel did a presentation on this at Java One a couple of years ago. Questions? Hopefully there's one thing in here that you can take it, that you found useful. Yeah. Do you have uh, any plans of updating the, the cache that API as well? The which API? The cache that the character set API. The character set APIs? I'm not aware of anything that's 
in the works or in the
or just in general, you have less GC activity, those are CPU cycles that need to be by the app. And what if the platform does not support CPU or the CPU is turned off? You're probably going to see some performance things. So, uh, one of the hardware platforms that's, being, uh, that's getting a lot of attention today is ARM64. And there's a lot of ongoing work right now to implement intrinsic for the string class on ARM64. There's been a lot of work going on in that area. All right, I hope there was something, at least one thing in there that you guys found useful that you could take back and utilize it more.